good morning. Ooh. <laughs> oh, great to see everybody. More and more people coming. Yes, yes, Women's Day. <laughs> So we get going because I know everybody also has work to do today and many things. But we also today want to network a little bit too, which I think is important. I was just reading the other day an article about the importance, again, of networking too and, and coming together to, to enlarge our, our connection. And to do that with purpose and with joy has never been more important. So anyway, welcome everybody to this win inspiring women, uh, inspiring the future session on the 2021 Women's Day. And sometimes my, one may wonder, do we still need the Women's Day? And I think the answer is very clear. Yes, we do, because we want to celebrate and we want to take a stand so that we can really be active in creating the future and creating this very moment in a way that makes us uh utilize all that we came here to do and that we have the freedom to do whatever we want to do also for the betterment of everybody for the planet and for our own life so i wanted to read something to, for you today that i have uh, wrote at some point and it goes like this i wish you happy international women's day you are precious on this day and on all days hair is reaching out to a woman near you to tell her how much you appreciate her. Her is also to embracing all of yourself and knowing your contribution means a lot and that your precious pres present is priceless. Her is to never taking human rights for granted and to continue to take a stand and allow more of them into our lives and into that of others. Her is to kindness and to generosity, including and integrating. Her is to setting boundaries and never accepting the unacceptable. Here's to building bridges and speaking up. Here's to being strong and being vulnerable, to feeling uncertain as well as certain, knowing that clarity is on its way. Here's to your brilliant, creative and fun you. Here's to your company, your community and the world being better because of you. Here's to knowing that together, together, women, women, women and men will try. So happy Women's Day, everybody. So before we go in to listen to these amazing women that we have invited with us today, uh, we also wanted to do a little um, group together. So we go and share a bit about who we are and one thing that inspires us today. So just a very, very quick, so be, be short with each other, make sure that everybody speaks who you are, what to do, and uh, yeah, how something that inspires you today. Great. So everybody's coming back. I hope you met some new people or that you found something new with somebody already new from before. <laughs> so this is great. So today we have with us uh, four amazing ladies. Um, that, I mean, you're all amazing women and we're just highlighting these particular ones here today. And the, one, the first of our speakers is Andrea Delanoi. She's the founder and president of Model, which is an organization she has founded herself. She's a former auditor for the Romanian National Court of Audits and Audit, and she moved to Switzerland back in 2003. And she has a degree from University of Geneva, and she's also uh, a founder of various other organizations, amongst others, Expanding Your Horizons, and an association promoting women in STEM. And she's now really working to uh, give attention to the gender biases and fighting stereotypes. So we look forward to hearing from her, but I'll introduce also all of them at the same time. Uh, one of our other speakers here is Maria Magdalena Heinrich. She's the strategy and planning officer at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN down in Rome. And uh, she has a, stra a strategic planning facilitated with more than 20 years of training experience for the UN and also for the World Bank. She's traveled uh, extensively around the world. She has an MBA from Lewis uh, and an MBA and an M 
MBA in English and German literature. And uh, she lives in Rome and she has three children and, and very blessed. And she's also very active in a women's informal network, which is a network that she has also um, founded with a lot of women in the various UN agencies uh, around. And um, uh, last, and then we also have Dr. Mara Harvey with us today, who is the founder and an author of Smart Way to Start. And she's passionate about educating girls or young people uh, to, to take care of the money and, and also uh, work on not only salary gap, but like build attention to that in the early years. She has two fundamental beliefs that daily money decisions are an untapped source of positive social and environmental impact, and that we cannot wait another hundred plus years to achieve economic gender equality. In her day job, she's a senior manager in finance with over 20 one year's experience in wealth management at UBS and, and so on and so forth. So she has a wealth of experience in exactly the area of finance and money. Uh, then our next speaker is Narmada Ramakrishna. She is CEO, co-founder of Pink Marani. And she is born and raised in India, but then discovered herself in Europe, as she says. And in, in this globalized world, she travels around and she's torn by being a citizen of the world, raising her own little family here in Geneva. And through her brand Pink Maharani, she is with, with high-end uh, Kashmir services. Uh, she has a chance to find deeper meaning and to work also with authentic craftsman womanship fashion in a non-religious, spiritual, deep and meaningful way to make a difference uh, around the world. So I am so happy to present all of you. So perhaps we start with Maria Magdalena. On this day, it's good you are in the UN, and this day was a day that the UN acclaimed as the 8th of March as a Women's Day. Please share with us some of the things that your organization and you are doing to empower women uh, in the world today. Thank you, Christine, and happy Women's Day to all of you. I'm so pleased to be here amongst these women, fabulous women. And as you said in the introduction, I work for the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization. And gender equality is essential to achieving FAO's mandate of a world free from hunger, malnutrition, and poverty. So the organization recognizes that um, still persisting inequalities between women and men are a major obstacle to agriculture and rural development, and that eliminating these disparities is essential to building sustainable and inclusive food systems and resilient and peaceful societies. Um, so in 2020, we published a revised gender equality policy, which will be implemented over the next 10 years, so 2020, 2030, which uh, um, is a solid instrument to basically drive FAO's efforts uh, towards addressing the inequalities that are still pervasive in agriculture and food systems, and to unleash the ambitions and potential of rural women and girls worldwide. The year 2020 was a pivotal year for advancing gender equality worldwide, as the global community took stock of the progress made for women's rights since the adoption of the Beijing Platform for Action in 1995. It will also mark the five-year milestone towards achieving the Agenda 2030 and its Sustainable Development Goals. So the root cause of the gender-based discriminations lies in social norms, attitudes, and still beliefs, you know, which shape how women and men are expected to behave, the opportunities they are offered, and the aspirations that they can pursue. So this is what we all have to work on, and this is what my organization is working on. <clears throat> wow, thank you for mentioning that. That's, uh, it's really important, it's really happening now. <laughs> wow. Andrea, can you tell me a little bit about what you are doing to promote gender equality and empower women and girls? Thank you, Kristen. It's very, it's very helpful for me that you introduced me after Maria Magdalena because I can build on what she just said. The root cause of gender biases has been uh, proven that are gender stereotypes. And these gender stereotypes are, are ancient old. Therefore, all of us, we all have them. How do we find, how model the organization that I founded uh, in 2018 fights against it? Well, 
I took the easy way. I work with children. I, uh, we offer um, um, events in classrooms. We invite inspiring women from all walks of life to talk to children about their jobs, open their horizons with the gender lens. So then children can see amazing women doing amazing jobs and realize that there is no such thing as female uh, jobs or male jobs. Uh, I started in 2018 because it was, um, oh, it's been 15, no, 12 years now that I've been working in different uh, capacities for um, gender equality. And what struck me since my arrival in Switzerland, as you say, in 2003, was the gender segregation that uh, is very deep in Switzerland, which means that women, uh, boys and girls, women and men don't do the same jobs. And uh, the whole school system is built in this way that girls and boys are set as of the age of 12 on different paths. And this we're trying to change with, uh, with the model, uh, with this uh, new project. It's my second, uh, uh, let's say, organization that I built around breaking gender stereotypes. And um, yes, I'm very, very pleased. I will, can, I will give you more details on future questions, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Andrea. And it's awesome you began it yourself. You know, I think that's always such a great thing. Narmada, can you share with us what your organization is doing and pioneering even for gender equality and, and also, you know, changes in the world and sustainability and so on? With pleasure, Kristen. Thank you so much. Indeed, I think one of the fundamental barriers to uh, gender equality is really the economic dimension of gender equality, and it all boils down to women's access to capital and involvement in managing capital. So that's what I uh, do a lot of in my day job. It's really about empowering people to have more impact with their wealth, but it's also empowering women to take part in financial decision taking. We've done a lot of research over the years that have shown that many women today, and even millennial women, you'd hardly believe it, abdicate a lot of the financial decision taking when it comes to long-term finances to their partners. They might be very engaged in the short-term daily uh, management of the household budget and so on. But when it comes to investing, when it comes to planning the long-term, women tend to take the back seat. And I'm trying to change that because I think women really need to take ownership of what they are worth, of their investments, of their ability to create wealth, and um, a lot of the work that we did was also to answer the question, how much does a pay gap impact a woman's wealth creation over a lifetime? And the results were very sad because even just a 10% pay gap can leave women with 40% less wealth. So this is why uh, from a finance perspective, we're really trying to make sure there is awareness for the magnitude in terms of wealth creation that pay gaps cause, that less funding to female entrepreneurs cause, and how big the opportunity really is if a woman have a seat at every table, including anything that's got to do with finance. Yeah. Thank you. It's super, super important. Uh, thank you for taking that on. And I'll ask you more questions later. I want to hear from Narma Ada, uh, what she's doing to uh, empower women, girls, and create a more sustainable value chain in all of this as well. Thank you, Kirsten, and uh, thank you, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. I'm joining in from India, so there is the unstable internet. So if that happens, I will just switch off my video so you can still hear my voice, just a mm -hmm. technical detail. Um, it's interesting because we all talk about women empowerment and what we can do. And I live in Geneva and I've lived half my life in Europe. So the perspective of women empowerment there is completely different to what I experience on a day-to-day -day basis in India, uh, within my own family, within my own friends. So it's really interesting to speak from those lenses, but yeah. we will keep those questions for later. So what we do with Ping Maharani is we're tackling this, this big issue of women craftsmanship. So craftsmanship by done by women. So there's a 250 million people around the world um, who do crafts work, craft 
whatever you call it, handwork in the handwork economy. Mm-hmm. And 70% of them are women. So we started this uh, social venture called Pink Maharani fo- focusing on handwoven luxury Kashmir, exclusively made in Kashmir to see if it was, is, it, is it possible to build this ecosystem of training women uh, and making sure that we receive the quality uh, that we want in Europe. So we work with many luxury houses in Europe at the moment. So it's interesting to see that we're creating not just this um, pay, this fair pay, higher pay uh, model, but it's interesting to see that women can be trained in this regard and create wealth for themselves and their families for the long run. And that I think, so that is very interesting. So this Pingmani is just one bubble of what we are envisioning to create um, as a big meta platform, which is what we are working at at the moment and we're at our investment round. closing in our investment round at the moment. So um, we work with girls to talk about menstrual hygiene, which is a big topic in India. Um, Having your periods is still a taboo, not just in India, but in many parts of the world. So we try to talk about very deep and meaningful topics um, just by selling a product. So it's not just about products we do. Uh, Gender equality for us is including the men in the conversation as well. So we have a lot of men and women in our groups to make this conversation happen. But we will talk about that more. Yeah, and Narmada, maybe I'll ask you immediately of that. It's uh, very interesting you are saying also there is uh, the handcraft. So you have artisan work and, uh, and there is, sometimes we wonder, are we still appreciating that in a world that wants cheap, cheap and mass production? And, you know, we have the big chains all over the world, whether it's uh, um, one or another. So, um, and many women are working in handcraft and also it's part of the culture. And we know also women are the typical bearer or the, the, the culture bringer in a society that bring that in the lineage forward. So share um, a bit also on maybe how you overcome obstacles to, you're saying you're selling also luxury because I, I can guess there are also people out there saying, no, 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 let's get in cheaper and, and you know, not wanting to give value to this work. What do you do to educate, to give value to that? And how are you met? It's interesting. Uh, it's a very good question, Kirsten. It's a big question, actually. So I'll just keep it very short. Um, so we work in fashion, it's pretty clear. And the, the majority of consumers of fashion are women. And, and funnily, the creators are also women. So be it craftsmanship, or I call it craft womanship, um, or working in the factories of Bangladesh or China or India or wherever they come from, uh, they are still women, you know? So we expect to wear clothes and look confident because yes, good clothes and beautiful clothes do add a level of confidence in how uh, you know we are. And, Um, but it's made with slave labor and uh, unimaginable conditions, uh, which I won't go into details, which you all know uh, pretty much. So I question myself, do we then empower women in that regard just when it's convenient to us, which is then our friends and our, you know, our circle and our bubble, as I call it, or do we really talk about women empowerment in a serious sense, which means investment, investment in the long term, So are you willing to invest in a t-shirt which costs five francs because it's just plastered all over your high street uh, shops and says that five dollars or five euros or whatever, um, do you go and pick that up? Do you spend a moment to think about it and say five dollars is what I'm paying here just to imagine the shipping and the customs and just those details, you know, and what is the person who's making it getting for that one stitch, you see? So that is sort of how we speak about it. That's our conversation. We say that if we are really talking about women empowerment, it's not, it's, it's not enough to just cut off where it's convenient. We yeah. have to go to the uncomfortable place, which is where the source is, which is where the supply chain happens, which actually where a major change is possible. A revolution is possible in that sense. But it would only work if we all work at it together, right? So we use the word luxury, but to be honest, it's just good quality, beautiful products made yeah. the right way. This is so interesting. And part of actually the feminine, if you look on the feminine or the masculine, but part of the feminine is this long-term thinking that we bring with us that and, and beauty also. And 
And the same goes for some art, whether it is the beauty of uh, seeing people as a whole person to food as well. And Maria Magdalena, when you work for the World F Food Organization, um, how, is, how is this sort of um, awareness of the long-term thinking in the empowerment of women um, in such a, such a thing like food that's so near to women? Please elaborate. Thank you, Christine. <clears throat> and thank you, Narmada. Actually, I think the key here is sustainability. No? So we have to think in terms of how to make uh, food value chains or value chains in general sustainable. So um, personally, in order to empower women, I work at two different levels. So one is um, through my organization. Uh, that has a, a gender focal point network. So in every office that we have worldwide, we have gender focal points in order to mainstream gender and to make sure that we integrate the gender dimension in all the work we do. And one very stimulating example is when I launched, when I coordinated the launch of a project on empowering women in food systems and strengthening the local capacities and resilience of small island developing states seeds in in the agri-food sector. So the project uh, aims to enhance women's participation in selected value chains where they are usually more active, such as honey, fisheries, breadfruit, poultry, and traditional food pro products, but also uh, arts and crafts that they make for the tourism sector. And um, through improved access to resources. Basically, what we're trying to do is uh, to give them access to technologies and good practices. And this will contribute to enhancing the food security and nutrition in small island developing states through the development of efficient, resilient, and inclusive food systems. And addressing gender inequalities is also key to overcoming the negative impacts of COVID-19, the pandemic, because it has a very high impact on rural livelihoods given that women play a crucial role in maintaining the household food security yeah. as agricultural producers, yeah. as farm managers, as processors, traders, wage workers, and entrepreneurs, like we're seeing here today. And in fact, women represent 52% of the agricultural labor force in small island developing states. So um, we basically act on three main areas. One is the institutional support. So we try to reinforce institutional capacities to develop efficient, gender sensitive and climate resilient agri-food value chains, because we know that the climate impact has uh, such an importance. And uh, the capacity development, so to strengthen the productive and entrepreneur, entrepreneur capacities of the women operating along these selected value chains through tailor-made trainings and workshops and uh, to improve the service provision. And then knowledge products. FAO is a knowledge organization. And so we document and we share um, promising practices and successful approaches across the regions. And we hope through our work to be able to upscale. So we have started with um, uh, three regions and six countries. So we have Barbados and St. Lucia in the Caribbean, Comoros and Cabo Verde in Africa, and Palau and Samoa in the Pacific. But the project really has the potential uh, to have great impact by scaling up within and across the regions. So we hope to replicate the activities in more countries. And the other side is why in my free time, I coordinate the women's informal network that you mentioned at the beginning, Christine. It's a professional uh, network for women in the international development sector. And our objective is to promote inspirational women's leadership and to strengthen women's managerial capacities. So we started on 8th March 2016. So today marks our fifth birthday and we are going to have yeah. a celebration tonight, Good. a cocktail uh, in <laughs> Rome. And uh, we have grown uh, from eight to nearly 800 members now worldwide with chapters in Rome, New York, Nairobi and Vienna. And our members work uh, mainly at the UN agencies, but also uh, some in IFIs, NGOs, and governments. And we coordinate different types of activities, such as exchanging advice on career development, sharing best practices on work-life balance, if that's mm -hmm. ever possible, um, providing informal mentoring and coaching. So I launched a mentoring program, which you know allowed me to see already a lot of women being empowered and move on to greater jobs. And so 
it's very, very exciting. And organizing networking opportunities to foster both personal and professional growth and yeah. inviting motivational speakers to inspire us as well as serving as a focus group on policy issues for our own organizations. So, so informally, we gather the information about what's not going well, and then we bring it up to the HR or to senior management, and then we're able to influence our policies. This is great. So we have a little and an entrepreneur within the large UN system. <laughs> and that is great. And I think that's a chance for so many, you know, how can you drive change by uniting people and coming together and starting informal networks and things like that. It's a great example. Thank you, Maria and Magdalena. And um, I was thinking now also, yeah, from good food to quality clothing, we talked a lot about the wealth uh, and the need for capital and, and the awareness and the value um, that is given to women's work, the value. And um, it's interesting to hear from Mara first and then Andrea also on this, when it starts at a young age. Um, how, do we, how do we deal with this economic emp empowerment of women? And what's your take on that, Mara? How to, how to accelerate, let's say, this value uh, of our work? I think we need to start early. We certainly need to continue the conversations with all the adult women. I think uh, women's networks are so powerful just because it helps us help the younger generations to not have to make the same mistakes we all made. I mean, to be very honest, uh, you, you come out of school, you come out of university thinking I'm equal to everybody else. And the only limitation is my intellectual capacity, my willingness to work hard. And then by the age of 35, you're kind of sitting there thinking, oh, this is it quite equal and then by the time you get to 45 you're like dear lord we're far away from equal and you know you're still sitting here at the age of 50 thinking i just wish the world were different for the girls who are going to come after me and um, again um, it was some of my research that really you know switched on all the light bulbs in my head because it became very clear that uh, pay gaps are not just a phenomenon of um professional life. They are visible in pocket money. There are so many statistics around the globe that show that girls by the age of 10 already get less pocket money than boys because we steer the girls to the unpaid chores and we steer the boys towards the cooler things where you can earn more money. And all the media messages are biased as well that you know women are put into the camp of the spenders and men are put into the camp of the earners. And I just wanted to debias these conversations and say, if we want the world to feel different, we need to change the conversations we're having with children. And therefore, all of my uh, night job uh, has gone into creating uh, stories and conversations around money and around sustainability for kids so that we can just change the narrative that they're going to grow up with. Um, and just one thing I'd like to share, uh, because it was so striking, was even my own daughter, who, she's now 15, she was 12 when the first book came out. She read the story and she said, oh, mom, this is super cute, but I don't see the point. Why would a girl earn less than a boy? And I was like, oh my gosh, my own daughter, she grows up with diversity for breakfast, lunch and dinner. And she has not figured out that this is not just a problem for my generation. And so I think that if we don't let the little girls know there are pay gaps and we let the little boys know it's not fair, um, we don't stand the chance of equipping the next generation with the skills they're going to need to fix the problems. Oh, thank you, Myra. It's a very good point what your daughter made. And I think many of us even experienced that in our lives. We thought there was no difference. And then you go in the workplace and suddenly hit the wall and realize it was. so. Yeah, very important. And the boys need to know it too. Uh, Andrea, so this is a very good point that we're reaching you here right now, working every day on this thing with gender stereotypes and in schools. So how can you work and what are you doing actually with the schools to make this educational system even more geared towards the empowerment of each individual and particularly girls? But uh, but I guess the, the boys are also part of it in this sense. So Absolutely. please share. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. As um, the American um, uh, militant uh, Marianne Wright Edelman said, you can't see what you you can't be what you can't see. Uh, 
Yeah. And it's so true. And I'm, I'm building on what Mara was saying that we need to start early to show to our children raw models, how they can see the world. We can support them, um, pre, um, showing to them what is out there. I mean, yeah. it shows that by the time children choose careers, they know a maximum of 10 uh, career paths. It's very low, it's very narrow to build a whole life on. So yeah. what model, what we're trying to do there is that precisely inspire children, boys and girls yeah. by bringing raw models into schools, show them what is out there. Why should they even bother to go to school? Because there is effort to put into, right? But it is a, an ending to that. It's a, it's a project that must and should bring uh, them to um, passionate uh, career path, right? It's all about motivation and our wonderful, we are over 140 now uh, volunteers mm -hmm. for, uh, for Model, wonderful ladies that go to school and transmit to the children, not only information about their jobs, but, in, and I would say for me particularly, their passion for what they do, yeah. their motivation to do what they do, transferring this skills to the children. Because when we are motivated, we, um, we find always the energy and yeah. I'll give you an example with my own kids because we're talking about I have two teenager girls you know teenagers uh, it's every Saturday morning they wake up at six to go to do horse uh, horse riding nothing in this world can make them wake up at 6 a.m on a Saturday but for going because they're so passionate about it there is no I don't have to to pull them out of the bed that I do with the school days right if this is the at the core of what we're doing in model showing to the children find the red thread red thread has to be passion find what passions you but you have to dig right be curious and find what 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 you have in your in your guts and that should be the red thread that that um, helps you get to uh, whatever career path and and in a lifetime today, especially, we don't have any more one career. You know, you start in a company and you finish in, uh, in the same. There will be many, uh, many um, career opportunities and changes to our life. But if uh, passion is at the core, we will always find the energy we need to uh, to get to, to our dreams. Dream high and follow that. Those yeah. Dreams. Oh, thank you, Andrea. So great you mentioned that. And I think for everybody out there now, and this is all of us, to create change, it needs a little extra effort and that extra effort to sustain it in the long run. That passion or inspiration certainly helps. And on that note, I'd like to have one comment uh, for each and every one of you as a closing one, which is related to how can we inspire even more collaboration and sisterhood, if you can, if you like, amongst women also, so that we can really excel and accelerate the change that's so needed in the world. Because I am also very convinced that in order for this world to really, really thrive and all of us thrive, it's also the women's leadership that's really needed now. And it's needed in our new, or not in this new, it could be even an ancient way, but in the way that is truly authentic to us also. So it's not about competing over or having power over, but it's about having co power with, collaborating with, and seeing the uniqueness, the uniqueness in each and every one of us. So who wants to comment first on that? How can we inspire sisterhood, collaboration, and accelerate change. Maybe Andrea wants to start on that. I think uh, I think you are a good one here. I think, I mean, what uh, as I said, we're over 140 now. And my uh, ambition is also to create a community of, uh, of role models. So then we share and also we network. Us women, we don't, we're not as good as men in networking. There are lots of reasons for that. We don't have, I mean, the day only still have 24 hours, right? And we all that we have to do, we often are not as good in networking, but it is important to create this, this um, um, sisterhood, as you say, and come together as authentic selves. When we are, when we are who we, we are deep inside, we can create magic. And by doing the, a little extra mile, for example, uh, I think when, when um, 
uh, when we get together women, there's this energy in the room. I remember when uh, our first um, um, right. meeting, my husband was there and he said, my God, this energy in the room, you women, there's something when we're around you. And it is true. When we get together, we resonate at a higher level. And I believe strongly that the women are uh, the future of men, as the, uh, as, uh, the poet said, because we, we are, we have been erased, we've been socialized to embrace empathy, using mm -hmm. our empathy to bring everyone at the table. Men, it's Thank not that men don't have empathy. It's just that they are socialized yeah. to hide it. So yeah. we are, we are at ease with welcoming and showing empathy. So bring this empathy, bring everyone in and move together towards the future we want to have. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. Wonderful. So bring empathy. Who uh, and my mother one sentence. Yeah, because, me. yeah, because I like the segue because she spoke about empathy. I like I just there's a nice segue because I always have this mantra. I say women have this feministic in them. It's in it's in us. It's very, very deep within us. But we are so shy to show our vulnerabilities. And I think our strength actually lies in our vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. And for me, the mantra is very simple. Just start showing your vulnerability right now from day one, show up and speak up. If you yeah. do that throughout, you will just see results on every level. And this is what I've been doing since I started. And it doesn't matter if I speak to a royal family or the president of a company or a cleaning woman outside. I think if you come from the space of vulnerability and saying, I'm no different to you, and I have this female energy. And even if you're speaking to a man opposite to you, you open something up in that person yeah. that will achieve you to reach with that person on an inner level, which we all want to connect with. You know, we're tired of all the small talk and the, you know, I don't know. The weather is, will always be the weather. It'll be bloody sunny or it will be bloody cold, you know. That's it, move on. You know, I'm tired of, you know, so I think we are at a level where we can really, really connect and we should connect on a deeper level, yeah. right? And especially this pandemic has opened our eyes and seen, I'm a biotechnologist by profession, right? So viruses and bacteria is what I did in my past life. So if a tiny thing can just shut, like just move our world and uh, change everything in a go, then imagine what nature is capable of. So. If that is what is in front of us, I think we should be hopeful that this has opened our eyes and be grateful to what we have and what we're doing. And I think that's very important to show that to everyone. And that's how we can keep that sisterhood alive and keep going strong. Yeah. Thank you for saying that, uh, being vulnerable and real. Thank you. Mara, what is your take on this? How can we inspire the future and sisterhood? So I'd like to build on several of the points that Andrea and Armada already mentioned, because I do believe that networking is something that women are notoriously bad at because we prioritize everybody else and our families and all the things that we need to do. And we always put ourselves last. And I think that a healthy dose of egoism there to say networking is not the 10th priority on the list, but it should be amongst your top three uh, is something that I would really encourage every young woman to do. The other thing is to really just reflect on how much influence you actually have every single day, be it as a professional, be it as a consumer, be it as an entrepreneur. Because when you stop to think about it, you realize how many women around you you can empower if you support them, if you help them, if you mentor them, if you coach them and so on. But also women drive 80% of consumer decisions on this planet, right? Everywhere in the economy. So if we drive 80% of the decisions as to where money is going, yeah. why is still money going in the wrong places? Yeah. It's because we're not doing it consciously. And this for me is something where I also think if we did it much more mindfully, we could get to equality much faster. And last but not least, as entrepreneurs, as Namada also pointed out, you really have the possibility to think about your value chains, your supply chains who are you empowering who are you purchasing from also for my books um, I was very keen to make sure it would be um, 
traditional artistic water quality, not just cheap and digital, right? Empower those people who have talent, who are artists, who, um, who, who need a place to shine and who can shine and, and think about who are providing the services to you and how can you through those services that you're consuming as, as a customer or as an entrepreneur help um, drive diversity and equality and a much more just uh, future for everyone too. Thank you, Mara. That's awesome. Maria Magdalena, any comments on you? Thank you. Yes, actually, uh, I, I can only build on what has been already said. <laughs> but in terms of how important networking is for us women and supporting each other, my motto is sharing means caring. So I think that it is good and important that we do things and I'm very much a doer and a very results oriented person but I believe that it is as important to inform people about our achievements through telling or writing our personal story we may inspire others and inadvertently uh, we may become their role models and so did you know that only 20 percent of the biographies on wikipedia are about women i mean do we have less experiences than men to share i don't think so but i believe we need to start telling the stories the success stories and also our vulnerabilities i agree with that and we need to in order to strengthen the, the sisterhood i think we need to uh, trust each other we need to support each other so when I'm doing something nice to a woman and it recently so happened and she thanks me, Marilena, thank you so much. I'm like, it's okay, but please return the favor to someone else. This way we can, you know, lift each other up and create that, um, spread that supportive mentality. And, and I like very much what Andrea was saying about passion and dreaming. We had a dreaming session in our network. So I really think we need to dream big, work hard, stay focused inside ourselves but also outside first inside because otherwise we cannot you know um, give that image or see the vision and we have to surround ourselves with good people so thank you all of you so it's wonderful insights wisdom experience shared and um i i like to just thank you right now and give some space also for the whole group together and um, I think one of the things that came up again and again here was this need to, uh, or this experience you'll have of giving value also to women's work, uh, to step out, but know with vulnerability, with care, and to think long term and to take a stand for the stereotypes that are not right for women or for boys also and girls in the long run. So we know though that the, the work is still there is some work to do and we will all have a busy life for a long time and and at the same time there is an awakening all over the world women and men are waking up and i'm saying women too because we know so well that we all have grown up in the same cultures as the men and often the women have equally many stereotypes in their mind as the men and and so it is a lot of work on the women too that we are it's not only oh i need to convince a guy no you also need to wake up a woman so i think all of that is, is but it's happening at an accelerated speed right now and and let's make sure it happens in this inspiring way so it's not always a fight that is that it's happening because we have passion inside because we are inspired because we attract and as humans and, and so on. Um, when we meet at the WIN or any WIN meeting, uh, networking is at the core of it. And it is that type of networking that is based on a web-based way of being together and how by two people coming together and how we are with each other, that enlarges that network of inspiration. And it's about being open. It's about expecting magic. It's about daring to share. It's about caring. And, and I think those that will go a long way. So before we close completely today, I wanted to have a chance for everyone to go into the little groups again to share one more little thing, because this is what we call networking with purpose. We have something, we're not just chatting, but sharing a purpose, let's say what inspires us, what finds a passion in you, is a way for all of us to, to get to know each other. So let's do this, maybe just focusing on what is one thing you can do to empower or inspire another. So if you can say your name, what you do, 
and one thing you do to empower or inspire another person. Yeah, I'll back again. That was quick. I know we didn't give you much time, but at least we got together. But meanwhile, please, I want to hear something from some of you. Um, I know Emi is here from Japan. You want to say, how is this day in Japan, Emi? You want to say that? Just one sentence. We have one minute for you. Oh, thank you. This is wonderful to uh, join you again. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. And how is 8th of March celebrated in Japan today? Mm -hmm. Ah, yes, uh, March, yes. We have uh, becoming much more bigger a uh, wave yes, okay. on celebrating it. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Amy. Anyone from somewhere else I want to hear from? I see though, Stella from Cameroon, you know, from Nigeria. Stella, you want to say one word about how, or one sentence about how it is in Nigeria today and how you're celebrating Women's Day? Okay, Nigeria is calm, but um, I am using the interface and the cultural dialogue approach to talk to women today as women in school. So I'm going to talk to some vulnerable groups at the IDC, that is internally displaced women. You're working with the vulnerable groups of women today? Yes. Oh, excellent. Thank you. And I think uh, that's a reminder also of all the more vulnerable groups around in every country and everywhere actually today and in some countries more than other to reach out and to do something if we can. And there's always something we can do to empower and uplift another. Anyone else wants to share? Lisa, what's going on in Zurich? Anyone, anything happening in Zurich today worth mentioning? I think there's quite a few things on um, this. There's, there's quite a few uh, online events, but uh, in person events, of course, of course, nothing that I'm aware of. Yeah. Okay. Kathy, Theo, Sue. Hello. Hey, Kristen. Happy International Women's Day. So I'm based out of Singapore. Um, we have a slate of events that's occurring uh, within Singapore by the different organizations. Uh, later on this week, we will have um, one of the semiconductors association industry, which tries to get women to stay on in engineering or STEM subjects. Um, so that's very inspiring to see what is the path forward, especially to uh, you know debunk gender yeah. stereotypes and to continue to get them to stay on and be in uh, leadership uh, positions. So I'm definitely looking forward to that because it's sponsored by the company that I'm with, which is Micron Technology. Um, so uh, hoping to, to be part of that recruitment drive there so that we could get more women to join us in engineering. Thank you. Well, so I'm aware now that time is going and this was going to be a, a, a quick meeting, but I do look forward to seeing you back at the WIN meetings. We have one more or less once a month. Uh, later on this week, we have also a very work related one where we're looking also at how we can create company cultures with more inclusion and a focus on creating careers also now on Zoom and working from home and what we want to bring with us from this past year into a the future into a post-COVID or with COVID situation, let's say. So I hope to see you at our next gatherings. And meanwhile, for the rest of the day, enjoy and uplift others and feel inspired. And more than anything, know that you are valued and you are heard and you are seen. And, uh, and that's so important and that the world is a better place because of exactly you, because of exactly us. So with that, I want to thank our panelists here today. I want to thank also all of you who came and who spent an hour of your time with us and other women and a couple of guys that are sitting next to some of our women here, I see. So <laughs> thank you all. And thanks for Juliana and Estella on the team to working with me to make all of this happen. So wishing you a brilliant day and bye-bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.